So uh, let's move right along because uh, we'll try to uh, do some discussion later on. Um, and so just I'll go ahead and introduce the next speaker who's here in the room. Uh, Dr. Marilyn Ritchie is a professor in the Department of Genetics and Associate Director for Bioinformatics in the Institute for Biomedical Informatics at UPenn Perlman School of Medicine. Welcome. All right, good morning, everyone. Hello to you too, Atul. Good to see you online. Um, so thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about the work that we've been doing in electronic health records today and how we've been thinking about incorporating environmental data with all of the clinical data that we get from, environmental, or from electronic health records, or EHRs. So first, I thought I would start by just showing you kind of what an EHR looks like. Uh, my assumption is that most of you in the room don't work in that space. And I'm sure everyone has been to a doctor that uses an EHR, but whether you actually sit and look over at the screen or not, you know, some people do and some people don't. So the EHR has lots of different features. So this is a, a, a screenshot from Epic, and these are ones that I found off of Google. They are not um, mine, and they are not... Uh, I don't even think they're real people. I don't think there's a fuzzy expialidocious in the world. But if there is, um, he posted it online or someone else did, not me. Um, so you have sections like the problem list, which are kind of what disorders you have, um, things about uh, health maintenance issues that you're um, being tracked for, um, allergies, medications that you're on, and things like that. Um, here's a screenshot from all scripts. There are several different EHR vendors and kind of one of the famous sayings, you know, if you've seen one epic, you've seen one epic. That's like a joke in biomedical informatics because they're all tailored for different health systems. So when I started to get involved with electronic health record research, this was uh, a long time ago, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But really briefly, um, they were formerly known as electronic medical records. So in case you're wondering what's the difference between an EMR and an EHR, Nothing. For some reason, the name changed. I actually don't know who changed it. You know, it's like Prince, the art artist now formerly known as Prince. They were EMRs, now they're EHRs. I think it has to do with the fact that some of what's in the EHR is related to our health, not just medical conditions. So we do go to the doctor to stay healthy as well. And so some of what's in there is about health. Um, a good reminder, and, and this kind of gets to where when I started in this space, these technologies were built for medical purposes. So pri the primary use is billing, right? So the physicians and hospitals need to get paid. And so an EHR was a, an efficient way to do that. Um, they are used for medical care, so ordering procedures, ordering medications, um, and they're used for scheduling so that you, know, you can get your appointment and then they can put in that you need to go to this other appointment and the specialist and whatnot. So they were not developed at all with the thought of doing research. And, um, and so one of the first questions we asked is whether you can do research using EHR data. And I was a, a huge skeptic. Um, this was back in maybe 2003, 2004, when I was first starting my faculty position. And it was one of the first things that was kind of handed to me to, hey, do you want to see if we can do this? And I was like, oh, we can't do this. There's, mm -mm, this is terrible data. There's no way we can do this. And I'll show you in a few minutes that obviously we're doing it. And we've heard about that in the last uh, several talks as well. Um, they were developed back in the 90s, so they're actually not that old, um, but they've been very widely adopted over the last five years because of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that mandated that um, healthcare entities use electronic health records rather than paper records. So as I said, can it be used for research? Well, obviously the answer is yes. The first publication that, that I was involved with on this was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. So I am a geneticist by training. Um, and this was kind of our proof of concept to see, can you get anything useful for research out of an EHR? And I, as I said, I was a huge skeptic. So we did this. I was at Vanderbilt University at the time. That's where my uh, first faculty position was. We took the first 10,000 people from our biobank. Um, this project was called BioView. It's still called BioView. but. Um, the, we took five clinical traits or phenotypes that had been published in genome-wide association studies recently with highly statistically significant 
SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, so certain variants in the genome that were known to be associated with these traits and that replicated across many different studies. And so we picked five. In some ways, it was really based on kind of the biggest effect sizes and smallest p-values that we could find in the literature at the time. And we started this study around 2007. Um, so GWAS, or Genome-Wide Association Studies, came about in about 2005. That's when the first one was published. So this was pretty early days. Um, all of the GWAS at that time that were published were from more traditional epidemiologic cohort or case control studies. So these were not EHR-based studies. So our question was really, can you use the phenotypes derived from an EHR as opposed to asking patients and having them kind of collected in a cohort um, for these traits? And I forgot to replace the XX, so I think it was 25 SNPs. I was going back to the paper to look, and I, I never updated the slide. So we tested the association for the SNPs that were published for the trait at, to see how many of them would replicate in a phenotype where we did not talk to the people, we did not ask them if they have Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis, we did not do anything other than electronically phenotype them. And so what we found, and I'll zoom into the figure so you can see it a little better, and I kind of highlighted with yellow stars the ones that met statistical significance um, at a p-value threshold of 0.05, but you can also notice at the bottom, so the blue is the published odds ratio, and the red is the odds ratio from our study, or the p-value from the published study, and the red is the p-value from our study. This is a synthesis view plot, and I'll show more of these later, so just to orient you, um, we have the genetic variant and then the trait kind of across the top. The Top plot is the negative log 10 of the p-value, so higher is more statistically significant, and then the odds ratio in this plot here. And this is just a way to kind of broadly look across the data quickly, and what you notice is that all of the associations trended in the correct direction, though sometimes the effect sizes were larger in the published paper, and for every trait, there was at least one SNP that replicated. And so the ones that didn't, we were grossly underpowered, so we just took 10,000 people randomly. It was like the first 10,000 through the door. And so I think for multiple sclerosis, we had 60 cases. Um, for some of the traits, we had more like 300. But these were not well-powered, designed to, to maximize our associations. But yet we found them. And so that led us to believe that, in fact, some of the traits you can get out of an EHR. Now, what I'm not showing are the abysmal results for type 1 diabetes. So pulling type 1 diabetes out of the EHR, at least at that point, was really difficult because almost everyone with type 1 also has codes for type 2 somewhere in their chart. And so it's very hard to differentiate type 1 from type 2 in the earlier days. We're getting better at it now using natural language processing and other criteria. But based on billing codes alone, um, type 1 was very challenging. So using EHRs in this way has really expanded. And one of the networks that I've been involved with is the Emerge Network, or Electronic Medical Records and Genomics. This is funded by NHGRI. And this map is just showing kind of the locations of the sites for Emerge across uh, the US. So this started back in 2007. We're now in our third round of funding, our third phase. Um, they are all biorepositories linked to EHRs. Each health system across the country is using a different EHR. And so kind of one of our goals has been, can you take EHR data from lots of different locations and combine it and use it together in some way? There are different sets of genomic data um, at the different sites. And it's not as though any one site has all of these. So um, some, uh, most have genome-wide association data. Some have pharmacogenomic sequencing data. So it's a set of targeted pharmacogenomic genes. Some have whole exome and whole genome sequencing. And in this round, we have a, a panel called EmergeSeq, which is targeted sequencing of the ACMG, so the American College of Medical Genetics, genes that are known to be uh, predictive of Mendelian disorders, and then a bunch of other genes that the sites threw on. And a huge range of phenotypes. So if you're interested in Emerge, I have the website here. So currently, there are 48 different phenotype algorithms that have been developed across the network. So collectively pulling out based on ICD-9 codes, which are the billing codes, or ICD-10 codes, which is the new iteration, as well as clinical lab variables, medications. Some have natural language processing elements as well. And there are 105,000 people 
that are a part of this study. Now, as I mentioned, not everybody has all the different types of genomic data, but they all have EHR data, and most have had these algorithms run on them. So I'm going to talk about a couple of specific studies that we've done, um, and then where I think this is headed in the future. So one is related to the Marshfield Personalized Medicine Research Project, or PMRP. Marshfield has been one of the eMERGE sites since the beginning, and it's one of the ones that I've been collaborating with since 2007. So the PMRP um, is a, the biorepository at the Marshfield Clinic, which is up in central Wisconsin. I think on the next slide I have a map just so you can kind of see where it is. Um, like most of the biorepositories, they're collecting data um, from their EHR system, which they've displayed like this in a publication. They have um, their data warehouse that stores all of the information from the different sites. Um, and then you can kind of pull all of the data out and use it for research purposes. And a number of these individuals have been genotyped. Um, so here's Marshfield. It's like right in the center of Wisconsin. It's a very rural area. It is the healthcare provider for that region. There really aren't any others. So it's a, a it's catchment is pretty much everyone. Um, I think they have about 20,000 people enrolled in their biobank. And of those 20,000, I think um, I think the population in that catchment area is maybe 22,000 or something like that. And I'm not sure if the other people said no or if they just haven't reached them yet. Um, but it's a, a very, almost everyone has said yes, very altruistic area. So about 4,000 of these people have been genotyped and, um, and, and also imputed. So imputation is where you fill in the missing genotypes that you don't have to try to make the data set larger. Um, I liked the point earlier that, you know, I think in all areas, big data is sometimes better, but sometimes big data is making it worse, and, and more data sometimes improves things, and sometimes it doesn't, and that's similar here. There are times the imputed data is great, and other times that it's really not. Um, 2,200 of these people also took some surveys um, that are part of the Phoenix Toolkit, which I'll talk about um, in just a minute, but specifically, they did surveys on alcohol use, smoking, sun exposure, hand use preference, depression, and stroke history. And they also did a dietary history questionnaire and a Beck physical activity questionnaire. So the Phoenix Toolkit is a, a series of questionnaires that have been put together by a, a group of investigators in the field. It's funded by NHGRI. The goal of this was really to put together harmonized surveys. So what was happening is that Every kind of cohort or case control study, and it, then now it was starting with the biobanks as well, were creating their own questionnaires. And then trying to take the way that we asked information about smoking, and the way that this place and that place, place asked about smoking, became really challenging because we asked the questions in different ways. And so you couldn't just combine the data sets. So Phoenix was an attempt to try to harmonize across all these different studies so that previous data could be combined, but more importantly, feature studies, you could just download these for free. Instead of creating your own and doing val uh, validity testing and um, you know, blinded review to make sure they're working the way you expect, you could just get them from this Phoenix toolkit. And so this actually just got renewed, I think, for another five years of funding. And so specifically for this meeting, um, I put a star here. So if you go to research domains from this website, you can get to the, uh, the surveys. And then once you're in here, they're broken down into the different research domains. And there is one specifically on environmental exposures. But as you can see, there's also social environments. I mean, there's just a lot of different areas of, um, of exposures and of uh, human health and disease endpoints. And then when you drill down specifically to environmental exposures, this is what you see. It has things about you know, exposures at work and at home and from hobbies and your residence and occupational and residential and UV. And so we used some of these in the Marshfield PMRP to try to um, get some environmental data about our patients. So one of the big challenges that I'm sure you can all imagine, how much of your life and what happens in your health is related to your health care, right? 99% of what happens to us happens not in the healthcare provider's organization. It happens at home. So we validated that these measures are, you know, do compare. So we did ask a few questions about health conditions and check that they are highly correlated with what's in the EHR, and they are. 
Um, so then we did some environment-wide association analyses. So this is where you just look for associations of your clinical traits with all the environmental variables that you've found. Um, the first EWAS was published actually um, by Shirag Patel um, and Atul Butte, our previous speaker. And so we saw this and said, oh, we should do this with our Phoenix data. And so we did the same thing for type 2 diabetes. And we actually found some really interesting findings. So here I have the synthesis view plot turned on the side. But our top hits for associations with type 2 diabetes were alcohol 30-day frequency and smoking at home. We looked then to replicate this in NHANES, uh, which is the National Human uh, Health, or thank you, Health Administration Nutrition Health and thank you, health, I'm not saying it again, <laughs> you heard it, um, to try to replicate them. And it turns out that we see uh, replication of alcohol and smoking. Now, again, the questions were asked differently this time, but we see similar effects. So then we went on to do some gene uh, environment interaction analyses. And uh, we used kind of that EWAS approach to go through the environmental variables to pick which ones to test with the genes. And then we took kind of our top uh, EWAS findings. So for this particular one, this is cataract is the phenotype that we were doing, so uh, the eye disorder. And fatty acids were our uh, most significant um, environmental variable. It's actually a nutritional variable. We then looked for association across the genome with fatty acid and associations with cataract. And we found a lot of variations in the genome where there's a gene environment interaction between a gene, fatty acid, and um, cataract. And this turned out to be something that's known in the literature. This was actually not a novel finding, but we were able to publish it anyway. We also had some gene environment or gene gene interactions in that as well. Um, we also did an, another survey of this and did a more kind of <coughs> genome-wide, phenome-wide survey, and this is a look across the genome, and there are tons of associations. And so now we're kind of trying to make sense of all of this. So recently, I've been a part of some workshops with NIEHS um, that were led by them, talking about the challenges with gene-environment interactions. And so um, a group of us just published a paper on kind of filtering the data, both biologically and statistically, because it's too much. As you just saw in that other plot, how do you go through all those results? It's way too many. So we need to get sophisticated. It's not just p-values and odds ratios. It's interpretation and meaning. And so we published a paper on using biological knowledge to try to kind of improve our ability to do gene-environment interactions. And then the larger group of us also published a paper on kind of more broadly all of the challenges and opportunities in gene-environment interactions. Um, we also published some software to do these broad G by E analyses, as well as GWAS and, and EWAS and FEWAS, which is phenomide association studies that I thought I would mention because it might be of use for folks here. So in my last minute, let's just tell you what the future holds, and I feel like the last few speakers have kind of hit on this. I think geocoding is going to be huge for the future of using EHR data because, as we mentioned, most of our environmental exposure data is not captured in the EHR. But Almost everything clinical or medical is. And so we really want to kind of marry our environmental and like what happens to us outside the hospital with what's happening when we are in the hospital or in the healthcare provider's care. Geocoding is a great way to do this if we can then link those geocodes with other databases of important environmental information that would be of use. Uh, mobile sensors and, and questionnaires are other ways to do that. Um, but those actually require the patients or participants to do something. Geocodes actually require nothing of the patient. It does require, however, that we have access to zip codes. So we can go to the EHR. Based on zip codes, we can geocode participants. So we do need to know their address and their five-digit zip code in order to do this effectively. You really want the full address. You can use, there's a lot of different tools to geocode. And then you can link those codes with public databases, things about access to different types of food, whether it's fresh food or fast food, um, access to or exposures of um, air pollution and water pollution. You know, there are lots of databases that we could link the data to, and then we could kind of do our analyses with the clinical data, the environmental data, and the genetic data. However, um, the issue around that has already come up is privacy. So address is a HIPAA identifier, and so you do need to have the right, uh, either a data broker or the right IRB protections in place. However, I think that, you know, 
EHR data has a tremendous amount of useful information that we can use for these types of studies. As I said, it's passive. We don't have to ask participants other than their permission to use the data, which we've talked about. Um, and whether, you know, every health system has a different consent model of whether it's opting in or opting out. And we could have a whole workshop on that. There are workshops on that. Um, but if we have permission to use the data, there's a lot of information you can get out of it for um, environment studies, gene environment studies. Um, and I think that geocoding work that is being done and it will enable us to get a lot of information about where people live and work and what they're exposed to. And I actually think that that could be more accurate than asking them. So if you ask probably the scientists in the room, you know, what are your kind of toxic exposures? We probably all kind of know what you know, how close we are to a certain type of mill that has air pollution, or things about the water in our area, or things about other exposures. But the average layperson, they don't pay attention. They don't look up where the power plants are in relation to their house or to their job. They go to work, and then they make dinner, and then they take care of their kids. Like, they don't think about their lead exposure. You know, how old is my house? Oh, should I look into what year lead paint switched? Like, you know, they don't think about those things. So I think that geocoding could get us information about participants that they don't even know and actually could help with some of that precision medicine work that we want to do to inform them about their exposures um, and especially if we do find gene environment relationships that are important for them. So for the average person, that exposure might not be a big deal. But if you do have a certain genetic mutation or, or variation, perhaps in your family it, it is important. So I will stop there um, and just want to acknowledge the members of my lab who do a lot of work uh, to make the things we do possible. So thank you very much. Thank you.